This podcast on Blood Brothers is looking at foreshadowing and how the audience's expectations of the characters and the plot are set up and then subverted over the course of the play. Now I want to begin by thinking about the concept of foreshadowing and what foreshadowing is. It's a central rule in really all of narrative fiction, not just plays, but novels as well. And what it essentially says is that anything that happens in the story that's important needs to be set up before it becomes important. So if the ending of your story involves somebody firing a gun, you need to have established that that gun exists in this world and is in the possession of the character who fires it at some point beforehand. What you couldn't do is just have the character randomly pull a gun from a pocket at the crucial moment and fire it. That would generally be regarded as dramatically unsatisfying. It's what's known as a deus ex machina, uh, which translates as God in the machine. And that's a term that comes from Greek theatre from uh, thousands of years ago, where a god character, like Artemis, would be hoisted up on stage by a literally by a crane called a Makani, and they would intervene and they would solve the plot with their godlike powers. And it's regarded as dramatically unsatisfying when something that's important isn't shown to be important up until it's needed. If you ever hear anyone describing a story as having a deus ex machina ending, it's a criticism. They're not uh, using it as praise. So the clearest example in Blood Brothers is the gun, the gun that's used at the end by Mickey to kill Edward. And this is established as being part of the world of the story through the robbery that Sammy commits. That's used in order to show that these characters have access to a gun. That way, when Mickey uses the gun on Edward, it doesn't look as if the gun's just appeared out of nowhere. Now that's a very, very practical example. There are many other examples of foreshadowing used in the play that are more to do with the themes rather than specific plot points. But then this brings us to this concept of subversion. Now, if we say that an idea is subverted, what we're saying is it's been twisted, it's been given a new shape, and it's now running contrary to our expectations. And we see this in Blood Brothers again and again. An idea or a theme or a concept is foreshadowed in one way, only for the reality of it to be a little bit different. So it's designed to be startling, it's designed to lull the audience into a false sense of security and then pull the rug out from under their feet. So let's look at this extract here, which is Edward imagining himself talking to Linda. i just tell you that I love you if it was me. I'm not saying a word, I'm not saying I care, though I would like you to know. So he's not actually talking to Linda. Linda can't hear him, so this is a manifestation of his inner thoughts. And it takes the role of a soliloquy. It's not exactly a soliloquy because it's a musical, he's singing it, but it fulfills the same role that a soliloquy would in a Shakespearean tragedy, for example, in that he is delivering his inner thoughts, which he wouldn't actually reveal to a character, to the audience. Now, because no other character can hear him, the audience can infer that he is sincere. When he says he loves Linda, he's probably telling the truth. The audience has no reason to doubt his sincerity or to suppose that he's trying to manipulate somebody else. So, this confession of love appears to be quite romantic, quite genuine, quite sincere, and presents Edward in a fairly sympathetic light to the audience. But the reality is rather different. When Linda gets together with Edward, it's not done in the romantic sense that the audience has been led to believe it would. We first hear about it when she sheepishly confesses to Mrs Johnston that she's just met some fella I know, he, he's on the housing committee, 
and it's fairly clear what's happening. Way before it's ever directly explained to the audience, it's clear that Linda's relationship or her sexual relationship with Edward has nothing to do with romance at all. She's doing it for Mickey in order to get them a home for themselves. It's based on his social status. He has the power and influence to get them a house. That does not require a sexual relationship. So the fact that he has a sexual relationship anyway can only be regarded as exploitative. He's able to trade that influence for what she needs. She has no social influence at all. She only has her body to use. And it's the fact that she needs that at all, when Edward could have pulled the strings he can pull anyway, that casts his relationship with her in a much, much more unpleasant light. But that means we now have to go back and reevaluate the earlier impression of romance. We've now got this sense that he has forced Linda into a into the role of a prostitute, effectively, and she would be regarded as a prostitute, probably more than Edward. But then before, he had appeared sincerely romantic, and he had appeared to be sincerely romantic in the context of not trying to manipulate another character who's only talking to the audience. So this directly subverts the foreshadowing of their relationship. It is foreshadowed, and they do have a relationship. But while the foreshadowing was sweet and romantic, the reality is very, very unpleasant. And this is something that we see again and again and again. It is not an isolated example. We can generalise this to say that characters very often have expectations that are romantic or idealised or simplified or unrealistic and then they have those expectations shattered by reality. So, for example, at the very beginning you have the relationship between Mrs Johnston and Mrs Lyons. The transaction, the sale of the baby, is presented as being so simple. Mrs. Lyons makes it sound almost trivial, and yet the reality of it is much more complex. Mrs. Lyons assumes that Mrs. Johnston's superstition is something to laugh at, and then it turns out it affects her as well. The children's first encounter with a policeman is presented as a relatively comic scene. So it does set up future encounters with the police, but it maybe doesn't prepare us for how drastic those encounters will eventually be when Mickey takes part in the armed robbery with Sammy. It's not the events that are different, but the tone that changes as the play goes on. And then there's the relationship between Mickey and Linda when they're teenagers, which is presented as very innocent and very charming and is something for the audience to just enjoy and find funny and amusing. But then they become adults and all the romance strips away and we're left with this tawdry, miserable relationship where Linda stays at home and gets the tea on for Mickey while he's working in a factory. So these events are foreshadowed, but they're done as a comedy, and then the tone suddenly dramatically shifts towards seriousness when we see what the payoff of this foreshadowing is. So to sum up, the play uses foreshadowing extensively, but if you just leave it there, you're slightly oversimplifying it, because it's a question of tone. The tone of the foreshadowing and the tone of the event that's being foreshadowed and will pay off later down the line are not necessarily the same thing. The play uses this tonal shift to start with comedy and then suddenly and abruptly switch to a much more tragic and dramatic form in order to startle the audience. It engages their expectations in order to subvert them. And we need to understand that this play is a tragedy. Even when it's using comedy, it's still a tragedy, and it follows tragic conventions even if they're not always easy to recognise in individual scenes. <laughs>